Thank you so much for um, having us this weekend, for your patience in listening. Uh, you have been uh, just a great group to work with. Thank you for looking like you're listening. That's, uh, that's always very, very encouraging. Um, and it's, it has been lovely to be, to be back in, in this network. We have missed it greatly. And it's just been a joy to, uh, to come home, which is what it's felt like. It's been great. So thank you very, very much. We're in our final session um, of, of this May teaching. The rest of this session just sounds wonderful. Um, we will swiftly work through this theme together this morning, which is uh, our final idea, which is we're together for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the little descriptor I wrote for this session. On what basis and with what boundaries should we work together with other believers and ministries? When is separation sinful? When is separation sensible? And when is separation essential? And we said last night that, uh, that um, it's not togetherness at any cost. There, there will be limits. There will be limits to what unity is possible sometimes. And that's what we're going to be thinking about tonight, this morning. It feels like that this morning. But, um, <laughs> but we don't want to end on a negative note, do we? We are together for Christ. We have this just adventure of taking the gospel to the nations together and, uh, and seeing lost lives transformed by an encounter with the Lord Jesus. But let's, let's think about this question first of all this morning. Uh, when, is it, when is it right, when is, is it, I'm so sorry you finished with a typo, when is it right to leave something or not join? When is it right to leave a ministry or just not to, not to align ourselves with a ministry? And let's make this point as, as our time together closes. When essential truths are being denied, that may be a very, very good reason to, uh, to break fellowship. When essential truths are being denied. And we see that principle writ large in the New Testament, don't we? Uh, the, the great issue, as you know, in the New Testament, the, the initial challenge for the church was, as the gospel in Acts goes from Jerusalem to Rome in 30 years, it breaks all kinds of barriers. And, and, of course, the biggest barrier it breaks is the barrier between Jew and Gentile. And, and the longed-for, anticipated blessing of all nations that came through the descendant of Abraham happens. And, and the Jewish church has to work out what its response to Gentiles flooding into the church is. Do they need to become Jews before they become Christians? Or is Christ sufficient? Is Jesus enough? And we get that debate live in the New Testament, don't we? And it, it ripples through the book of Acts. It's particularly vivid, of course, in the book of Galatians, but elsewhere. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, that, that's a radical rewriting of the gospel, isn't it? Essential for salvation is circumcision. Essential for salvation is, is not just Jesus, but Jewish ritual on top of it. And this brought Paul and Barnabas rightly into sharp dispute and debate. So when we, we cannot be discussing unity and togetherness at any cost. There will be limits, and, and one clear limit will be when essential truths are being denied. And that moment may be a very painful moment. And we know it was a painful moment for Peter and for Paul. He describes it in Galatians 2.11. When Cephas came to Antioch and was influenced by this kind of doctrine... Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. When we read that account, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, you smart, don't you, when you read that, that head-to-head -head that these two apostles had to have when one, was, when one was in error. But we'll need the courage to do that sometimes. John, John Piper has a lovely phrase. He says, Som sometimes conflict is what is courageous, but to enjoy it is prideful. I think that's really helpful. Sometimes to, to confront is courageous, but to enjoy confrontation can be prideful. So it's, it's, it's going to be necessary, but hopefully not enjoyable. That would be a, a good balance for us to get. So when is it right to leave or not join a church or a ministry? Well, when essential truths are being denied. When is it right to leave or not join a ministry? Well, we should say should, too, shouldn't we, that sometimes it's, it's right to leave when to stay will risk serious harm to an individual in some way, where there is, and, and this was one of the, the tragedies that we've experienced in, in recent months, where the, a departure uh, was necessary because for the individual to have stayed would have put them under such emotional strain that it may have done them lasting damage. And, and some, sometimes, tragically, 
we will be in those kinds of situations. We used the analogy in the seminar this morning of, uh, of some of our Christian truths being like a, a guitar string. And, uh, and Nathan's beautiful guitar playing would not be possible unless he has strings that are strung in tension between two fixed points. And we discussed this morning the two fixed points of biblical idealism where everything we've been talking about this weekend, we're in Christ and he is in us. And that has to make a profound difference of love, joy and peace in our lives and our communities. And the world will see we are followers of the Lord Jesus through the love we have one for another. That biblical idealism that we hold to and we pursue and we've been discussing and, and rejoicing in. But there's a biblical realism too. Those kinds of verses that we've just looked at are evidence that even the Apostle Paul, who spoke so much about unity, himself had a falling out with Barnabas over John Mark. And, and we'll, we'll hold our lives in this tension between idealism and realism. And, uh, and, and that's when we'll probably find our communities and as individuals, we really are making a, a lovely noise when we get in tune in that kind of way. But sometimes to stay will risk serious harm. And that may be a moment to, to consider departing. Um, I think this was, um, some of you may remember Peter Quant, who I think was, um, he was part of Paternoster, wasn't he, for several years up in Carlisle. I think a member at Hebron up there. And I think I heard this phrase from Peter first in a conversation with him. He said, there's leaving a church should be on a par with getting a divorce. Have you ever heard that? I've, I, I'm not sure whether I agree with that, so I put it in speech marks. But it, that idea has stayed with me. Leaving a church, Peter s suggested, should be on a par with getting a divorce. Um, and what he meant was, sometimes in a marriage, uh, there's a tragedy occurs where breakdown of relationship is so irreconcilable and where every other avenue has been explored that to, to, to hold the marriage together will involve such harm and, and toxicity, just potential damage to the individuals concerned, that separation is the lesser of two evils. It's a great sadness when we get to that point, and some of us may have been through it. It's a great sadness when we come to that point, but sometimes it will be the lesser of two evils. And Peter said he loves to think of leaving ministry on that kind of level. Sometimes it tragically will be necessary. It will be the lesser of, of two evils, but to stay could just cause such pain and toxicity and further damage that separation may tragically be what's required. I, I quite like that idea too, because that leaving a church should be on a par with getting a divorce thing, because it just stops a casualness, doesn't it? It stops a, a kind of slightly more consumerist mentality in our thinking about when we are leaving and, and indeed when we're joining fellowships. So I'd be intrigued to know what you think of that. Not right now, but later on. Um, and thirdly, uh, on this first point, when is it right to, to leave or, or to not join a ministry? Well, when leaving furthers gospel work on earth, that's a pretty great reason to leave a ministry, isn't it? So in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and, and they sent them off. They, they, um, off they went. And uh, that's a great reason for leaving. When, when a body of, of believers says, we are commissioning you to go and, and, and expand the kingdom, to build the kingdom, to see uh, the church on earth grow, that's a great, great reason for leaving. And of course, it, it should be, I, I guess, the mark of any growing organism, shouldn't it? That there will be division. As, as things grow, they divide, and new life starts to emerge. It's the great church planting principle, isn't it? So that kind of division is, is deeply healthy. Difficult sometimes, isn't it? One of the great challenges we had at, at Belmont, I remember for years I was in charge of the small group network at Belmont, amongst other things. And our small groups would thrive and grow and people would join them and uh, our neighbours would join and, 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 and some of it was new growth from new Christians coming in, some of it was, was con conversion growth, it was great. But the groups would just grow and they would get too big to sit in, a, in one living room and they would need to divide and the group would have to become two groups or two groups would become three groups. And it was blood on the wall time, every time, when you tried to do that with, with small groups, because people loved their community. They loved the relationships. How, how can you split up our family? But that's, that's part of the pain of growth, isn't it? And, and we were always so grateful when we had individuals in those groups who from the inside would be going, no, this is necessary. If we're gonna keep growing, at some point division is gonna be just healthy and, and right. We've noticed something going on in um, at Cape and Ray this year where the level of homesickness 
of students who've just arrived with us. They're in their f starting their sixth week with us tomorrow. Uh, the level of homesickness this year seems to be higher than we've ever experienced before, certainly in my time at Cape and Ray. And, um, and I don't know if you, and I think the, th uh, the reason I think is because people have been in lockdown, they've been at home more than they usually are. And they've traveled less than they usually would. So for some of them, they've had very intense relational experience with parents and siblings, which has been great. And they've not had a chance to travel elsewhere. So the culture shock of suddenly being away is much greater than usual because the family context they're coming from is so strong. There was a stat out a couple of weeks ago when students were going to university in the UK. Do you see that? 98% of parents, I don't know how they got that stat, but 98% of parents sending, sending, sending children to university were reporting how bereaved they felt by having lost their children to go to, to uni. Uh, but so it's, it's going to be painful when this kind of organic growth happens. But let's prepare for it and celebrate it when that kind of division takes place. And then secondly, and, and, and lastly, um, but don't get excited because there are five points here. But secondly, and, and lastly, when is it right to stay? When, it, when is it right to stay or join something? If those might be the reasons for leaving, uh, when is it right to stay? Well, of course, sometimes staying and fighting could save a church. So certain people come down, as we've seen, from Judea to Antioch and start to, to preach a heresy into that church. Uh, what do Paul and Barnabas do? Do they go, well, this is the end for this church. We couldn't possibly stay in a church that tolerates this kind of false teaching. We are going to leave. They don't do that. They stay and they fight. They have a sharp dispute with them. And there's a principle, isn't there, that, that bad churches or churches in danger or weak churches are only going to get better when good people stay. Bad churches will only get better when, when good people stay. I think I shared that I became a Christian uh, in my teens through Crusaders. And, uh, and the man that was the, as they called them, the padre on the camp where I became a Christian stayed in touch. Um, and he's discipled me pretty much ever since. So this is a discipling relationship that is now getting on for, um, for, for four decades, four and a half decades probably of discipling. And Graham is now well into his 70s. And, uh, and I can remember when I was at the point of leaving home to go to university, uh, ringing Graham up and saying, Graham, I need to, when I get to Liverpool, I need to choose a church. How do I choose a church? And Graham said, well, what you do is you get a map and you put a pin where your hall of residence is and you get a pair of compasses and you, and you draw a circle around where you live, and you find the church nearest to where you live, and that's the church you go to. And I said, what if it's not a very good church? And he said, well, join it and make it better. That, that was how I was discipled in the whole principle of, of church choosing when I was a younger man. Um, I've, 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 I've left a church three times in my life. I left Fords Lane Evangelical Church in Stockport when I went to university in Liverpool. And then I left Dovedale Baptist Church in Liverpool when I left university and went to Exeter. And interestingly, Dovedale Baptist Church was the church closest to my first hall of residence. And then I left Belmont Chapel in Exeter in 2017 when I, when I went to work at Cape and Ray. So there was, there was, there's something in that early discipling that I received that just said, um, stay, stay and make things better. Now, I know that won't always be right, and, and I realize we're speaking generalities into a great number of specifics. This won't always be right in every circumstance. But s staying and fighting is, could be to save a church or to make a, a, a struggling church better, that's a great reason to stay in a church. Secondly, when is it right to stay or join? Well, when the value of togetherness trumps disagreements about non-essentials. When the value of togetherness trumps disagreements about non-essentials. So this was the, these were the verses that Martin read for us last night when he and Beth led that incredibly helpful session on describing what the delivery group had been exploring. And, and again, possibly one of the most ignored sections of the New Testament. But see what you think. Jesus says, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. So this is the Son talking to the Father. This is a conversation within the Godhead. This is the heart of our God being communicated to us. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you're in me and I'm in you. 
May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. So our togetherness is God's will and our togetherness will have evangelistic impact. And th those two truths should, should make us yearn for unity and, and ensure that we do really make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But in my very limited perspective of what's been going on in this country in maybe the last 30 years, I think one of our greatest dangers to, to unity has been when, to, when um, disagreements about non-essentials have been allowed actually to, to break unity. Uh, Jonathan, um, Jonathan Lamb has, has just published a really helpful book that I read uh, partly in preparation for this weekend, Essentially One, Striving for the Unity God Loves, um, published by IVP. And, and as ever, Jonathan's writing is just clear and, and biblical and, and very, very helpful. But he, he, he mentions this issue in that book. He says this, there might be occasions when a lower order issue is elevated, to a first, is elevated to first order importance. When a particular view, such as the exact details of the second coming, or the precise process by which God created the world, and here's the phrase I find very helpful, becomes a test of orthodoxy for all Christians, inevitably leading to unnecessary division between fellow believers. Have you had that experience where someone says to you, listen, I know that what you think about creation is not, is not gospel central, but my, my sense is, if you get this wrong, if you don't agree with me on this, if you get this wrong, I'm not really going to trust you on anything else. And therefore, I'm really not going to be willing to have fellowship with you. That, that, I think that has been a sort of creeping tendency, particularly across our evangelical community over the last 30 years. Um, you know that I, I, I cut my kind of leadership teeth as a student. And I can remember in the 80s, I was a student in the mid-80s, uh, UCCF would have a very strong emphasis that we have a doctrinal basis, that's the core doctrines around which we center, and then there are secondary issues, as we called them, which are, should women be preaching and leading, um, are, is the gift of tongues still around today, should we baptize children or believers, there's, there's a range of secondary issues, and because they're not core to the gospel, we can agree to differ on secondaries, but we can have unity together in this task of evangelizing our campus um, with the gospel. And I th my sense is, we've, we've, over the last 30 years or so, we've lost that to some degree because we start to take these, these secondary issues as markers of orthodoxy. I know it's not central, but if you don't agree on that, I don't trust the way you read the Bible. And if I don't trust the way you read the Bible, I'm not going to work with you. I think, we've, I think we've lost something there. If, if you want another great book on particularly this issue, could I recommend Finding the Right Hills to Die On, published last year by an American, Gavin Ortland, And, and he, he addresses this issue too, I think very helpful. And he's, he's particularly looking around the issue of complementarianism versus egalitarianism. Should women, uh, are the roles of men and women spiritually, of course, absolutely equal, but do we have different roles in the church? Um, or is it egalitarianism where there's an absolute equality of what women can do in the church based on gifting and character? Or are there complementary roles that we play um, reflecting the differences of role within the Trinity? Th those roughly are the two positions, complementarianism and egalitarianism. You'll be familiar with them. And uh, Ortland is a complementarian, but look at what he says. The root concern many complementarians have with egalitarianism is the hermeneutical trajectory it sets. Just as egalitarians often regard complementarian hermeneutics as dangerous. Whether these concerns are valid or not, one cannot deny that this is part of the debate and it escalates into divisiveness. He says it would be better to recognize that there are a variety of expressions of each view and to look for points of contact between the more thoughtful and careful proponents on each side. We must be wary of labeling this a second rank issue on paper, but allowing it to occupy a first rank position emotionally and practically. 
And I read that and I just want to cheer. I just want to cheer. Because it, it feels to me like, like in, in the evangelical circles, we have increasingly allowed our unity to be broken by making positions on, on second level doctrines boundary markers of our orthodoxy and therefore whether we trust each other. If we can, if we can stop doing that, I think that will be a major step forward for the unity of the church, um, would be my personal view. And again, if we get time to before we, we leave, any thoughts on that, I'd be really grateful for you to share. Okay, third of five. When is it right to, to stay or to join? Well, when we say no to consumerism. When we say no to consumerism. So this is Paul speaking to the Ephesian um, elders in Acts chapter 20, and, uh, and we get a phrase that Jesus says that we don't read in the Gospels, interestingly. But uh, Paul says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We don't read that phrase in the Gospels, but he said it, because Paul tells us he said it. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's, that's the Gospel economy, isn't it? We, we receive when we give. And we'll have experienced that in all sorts of ways in our own lives, won't we? I, I experience it here. I, just, I, I hope it's been a blessing um, to us all being here. I, I, I wonder if it's the experience of those who've, who've had to give that we've, we've said, although we've given, we have just received so much. In the Christian economy, as we, as we, as we give, we receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. We are not a consumer worldview where it's about me and what I can get. That's, that's not the way it works. We never lose uh, when we give. Is this a problem in your church? This is, we're, about to, we're about to celebrate communion. Okay, so let's, let, you know these very famous instructions in 2 Corinthians 11.20. Is this an issue in your church? When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. When you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in? Does that describe communion in your church? Is, is that a live problem for you? I'm guessing not. I don't know that many of us will come to the communion service and there's a group of wealthy retired people in the corner with a waitrose hamper and, 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 and their bread has three kinds of olive in it and they've, and they've got the finest bottle of burgundy and they've put a kind of barrier of chairs around the bit of the church that they're going to celebrate communion in and nobody else is allowed close to it. And, and they polish off not just one bottle of burgundy but four and then they start singing inappropriately halfway through the communion service. I'm guessing for most of us that's not a problem, is it? So, so, so what, is the, what is the principle and the application of this verse for our churches today? I had a, I, we had a lovely Frontiers church in Exeter and I had a very good friend who was an elder there. And they were, they were thinking about the way they did church generally. And they came to this passage and they said, what's, what's the principle of this passage? Because this, this isn't an issue for us. So what's the principle? And they decided the principle was this. Don't come to church hungry and selfish. That, that, was the, that was the principle they drew from this passage. Don't come to church hungry and selfish. So they applied this in this way with their congregation. They said, listen, if you come to church and what you really want, what you're expecting, is 45 minutes of continual Hillsong worship, you're not going to get it. But these days you can get that. Why don't you get that on Saturday night at home or Sunday morning before you come? Go online and enjoy 45 minutes yourself of Hillsong worship. If that's a need you have, um, satisfy that need before you get to church so you don't come to church hungry and, and selfish. Or if, if you are desperate for a, a 45, 50 minute expository sermon to a sort of John Piper, Wayne Grudem standard, you're not going to get that in the Exeter Frontiers Church. You'll get some good Bible teaching, but you won't get that. But if that's your expectation, you can get that these days very easily. Go online and, and satisfy that hunger for that in yourself. And then come to church ready to give. Come to church not, not demanding that your needs and preferences be met, but come to church ready to give. Don't come to church hungry and greedy. Now, of course, we need to have a balance in that. It's perfectly appropriate for our churches to meet one another's needs and we bear one another's burdens and we're gifted so that we can be meeting the needs we have. That's going to happen. And there'll be times when we come and that will, of course, be extremely appropriate to expect to see our needs met. But I love that as a general principle. Why not come ready to give 
rather than simply expecting to receive. Let's, let's say no to that kind of consumerism. Fourth out of five, when is it right to stay or join? Well, we said this last night, when resolving conflict makes the gospel visible. It is such an easy thing to do, isn't it? When, when uh, we fall out with somebody or when there's a problem or when there's a disagreement or when there's a clash, some cause of disunity, it is so easy to say, I'm going. That's the easiest thing to do. It's often painful, but leaving is often much, much easier than staying and seeing a problem resolved. But that's the gospel thing to do, isn't it? We were looking at this verse in our seminar earlier. If a brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen to you, you've won them over. And we were reflecting on that verse this, this morning and, and just look, remembering the way that, that pr- process escalates if that first step doesn't work. And you'll be familiar with the passage. But we were also saying how, how frequent it is for us not to do that. For us not to just do the basic biblical thing of, if I've got a problem with you, before I go and moan about you to somebody else, I'm actually going to just to talk to you face to face. We're just going to have a conversation and see if we can get this resolved face to face. And we make the gospel visible. It's not if we're going to upset each other. It's when we're going to upset each other. And, and then the answer, the question is then, what do we do when that happens? Of course it's going to happen. I'm a, I'm a mess, you're a mess. Of course it's going to happen. What do we do when it happens? Are we going to model in our relationships, make visible in our relationships the reality that we're just about to remember as, as we, as we um, take the elements together? We make the gospel visible. So we are going to be kind and compassionate. We're going to forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. We are going to follow God's example as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are going to make the gospel visible. And it's often in, in, if, we, if we're in the habit of doing that in the smallest moments, that will, often, that will often help us when things get bigger, won't it? I had a, a weird little experience the other week where there was a, an email exchange going around about, of all things, a lost stapler. And, um, and, I, and I sent an email back, um, to, this was to all staff, and I sent an email around saying, whilst we're talking about theft, capital letters, uh, whoever's stolen the guest lecturer's jug from the Bible school offices, please could you return it? And what I should have done was stuck on a load of funny face emojis to show that I was not serious. And I didn't do that. And, uh, and of course, email is utterly tone deaf, <laughs> completely tone deaf. So I had a, one of my colleagues, who is of quite a sensitive nature, writing back to me and saying, Derek, I think, that, I think you've been too harsh there calling this theft. Somebody, somebody will just have borrowed it and forgotten to return it. And my initial reaction was, I was joking! Ah, rah, rah, rah. That, that was my initial reaction. And you know that, that thing where in you bubbles up all the muck and the pride and the insecurity and, uh, and, the, fi- and the fearfulness and what do other people think? All that stuff bubbles up. And, if, and it, uh, that, that old nature stuff. And I could at that moment have just responded out of that. I was joking! And I stopped myself, and I didn't do that. And instead, I thought, let's, let's, let's see if we can gospel this out a bit more. So what I did was I apologized. I'm so sorry. I intended it as a joke, but it wasn't clearly enough expressed. I certainly didn't mean any offense. Please forgive me. And I got a lovely email straight back saying, oh, of course, <laughs> Uh, I probably misread it. None of us are at our best at the moment, are we? And, and what happened was a moment of tension was resolved into a strengthened relationship with a staff member I didn't actually know all that well. And, it, and it's, it's lifted our relationship to another level. It started off as, as conflict. And, and because we resolved it in a gospel manner, it has resulted in a strengthened relationship. And if, if we're in the habit of doing it in the little moments the big moments will probably become less and less frequent. And whilst we're on it, um, someone came up to me after our seminar to talk about email. And, and we should have mentioned this in our seminar this morning. I, I will never use email to express anything negative. I will, I will use email to express, commu- just to communicate, or to, or to say positive things, or to encourage. Because I think it's, it's the worst medium to actually express negative or critical things. It is tone deaf. And if we have something difficult to say, let's find another medium to say it uh, rather than email. It's just too much damage is done. Last thing. 
When is it right to stay or join? Well, when uniting is a better use of kingdom resource. Sometimes dividing and separating is the best thing for the kingdom. But sometimes uniting or joining will be the best use of kingdom resource. And that's a great question, isn't it? We've had a conversation a couple of times this week with folks about church planting and, and how church planting is a great thing. We've had the experience in Exeter where we're at Belmont, we're in the middle of the city, there's, a, there's an Anglican church literally three or four hundred yards across a car park behind us, and, and twice now, uh, regenerating ministries have come in to kind of regenerate St. Matt's in Newtown, Exeter, um, without any consultation with us at all. And, and great, they want to regenerate a church, but you'd kind of think, wouldn't you, why don't we go to the people who are already ministering here and say, what are you doing? We want to help. What are your strengths? Where are, you, where are you a little bit weaker? How can we partner with you to ensure that the resources that we have can be used for the, for the, for the growth of the kingdom? We're not good at that as, as evangelicals, I don't think, are we? We're, we're just not good. We're still a little bit too tribal, a little bit too streamed. We're, we're more interested in empire than in kingdom too often. And, and, and we have to repent of that, which was what, why what Beth and... Martin led for us last night, I thought was so, so powerful. Do you know this, this um, bizarre little um, parable, Luke 16, the parable of the shrewd manager? Isn't that a weird parable? Um, I tell you, Jesus finishes it. The guy that, do you remember the guy that had, was fiddling his, his bosses? He's been wasteful with his boss's resources. His boss says, you're fired. And the guy has got this much time when his boss's stuff is still under his control. So what he does is, rather than fill his pockets with the stapler and the petty cash, and, uh, and the seller tape and make a, do a runner, he brings in his boss's debtors and starts slashing their debts so that he uses somebody else's stuff in a way that is going to be relationally beneficial. And he gets commended for it. I tell you, Jesus says, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, I, I take that to mean... I've got some worldly wealth now, and so have you. I have this much time. I have, I have a few spiritual gifts. I have an education. I have a, a personality. I have some experience. Um, I, have a, I have a wife. Uh, I, have, I have a vocation. I've, I've got all these gifts, this worldly wealth in my life. Am I going to use this effectively to gain friends and be welcomed into eternal dwellings? By that, I, I read that to mean, am I going to use the stuff that God has put in my life now in, a, in the most effective way possible to see as many people encounter the living Lord Jesus Christ so that the group of, of brothers and sisters I have when I'm welcomed into eternal dwellings is as big as possible, that I've used my life and my resources that well. I've stored up treasure in heaven, which I think is people. I've stored up treasure in heaven in that way. Or... Am I going to use the resource that God has gifted me with as an individual, as a church leader, as a ministry leader? Am I going to use it in parochial, selfish ways, which will actually limit the amount of kingdom growth that is seen? And there's this little hint, isn't there, in Luke 16, verse 11. If you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, which I think is all that stuff, time and everything else, who's going to trust you with true riches? And I think there's a little hint there about we're going to be trusted with stuff in the next life as well. And, it, and how we've handled what he's entrusted us with now, that will be the measure that's used for us. So sometimes it will be right to stay or join when uniting is a better use of kingdom resource. And my personal sense, for what it's worth, which is probably not a lot, but my personal sense is this stream, this movement, we're at that point. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just the joys that we've been remembering this weekend and that we're going to uh, experience now around the table. Uh, thank you that we can know fellowship together because the God in whose image we're made is perfect community. I thank you that we've been invited into that and thank you that you have made that so vividly possible because the Lord Jesus is in us and we are in him. And we pray that we would delight you in the way that we make those truths visible in this lost and needy world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.